LGBT people are calling out disingenuous pride merchandise. This is the focus group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's the focus group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Welcome to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host Tim Bennett. Find us on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Facebook Live or YouTube. And of course, all of our media is at focusgroupradio.com, including TFG Unbuttoned, the Focus Group Unbuttoned. That's our Tuesday podcast. We would like you to subscribe and like and rate that and rate it as a five star, of course. And again, all of that is available at focusgroupradio.com. And if you want to reach us, letters at focusgroupradio.com. So here we are in the middle of June. Happy Pride! The Pride <laughs> Leprechaun says, top of the pride to you. I still remember doing that during the first Pride. I invented that and had a lot of quizzical looks. Like, are you on something, mister? <laughs> I wonder why you associated the, uh, the Leprechaun with Pride. Um, it came out of a group of us were having hilarious conversations about how, um, pride seemed to be like gay Christmas, you know, like, you know, and then there was that whole Scrooge thing. I say, I say, but run down to the local store and give me the biggest dildo in the window. What day is today? You know, so Scrooge ended up going into, you know, top of the pride to you. Happy pride. pride. Well, our friend Lauren found a couple of images. <laughs> I, yeah. So I saw Lauren had done that. <laughs> So, Mr. Nash, you, uh, you've you avoided telling our listeners uh, that you're making your big movie debut this week. So tell us all about it. I, <laughs> I'm so excited, and I, I tried to get a ticket, but it's sold out. So Tim's talking about the fact that I'm going to be a talking head in a, uh, a documentary called Coded. Don't minimize, don't minimize it. You, you're, it's, you could win an Oscar. I'm in the right? cast. I'm actually in the cast. It says cast, John T. Nash. Uh, so it's about J.C. Leindecker, a famous illustrator who is a contemporary of Norman Rockwell's, and he created the uh, iconic arrow shirt collar man. Years later... Um, it was revealed or people discovered that he was gay and uh, it, it changed the way, the way we looked at uh, a lot of his previous illustration work because he usually specialized in men's fashion and he had a very specific, I don't know, even before I knew he was gay, I thought, boy, this guy's got a good eye for capturing the male form. But as I said, it's the documentary called Coded and it's a Tribeca Film Festival debuts on Thursday. I think I'm going. The producer said they're very stingy with tickets and he had one ticket for me, but... We'll see. And, you know, Tim, I was wondering, like, with these film festivals like, uh, you know, t uh, Tribeca or like, uh, you know, ones out west, is this where studios pick stuff up to, like, put on their channels and stuff? I think so. Could be, I, so I look to see if I can get a ticket and go watch it. as well. It's sold out. It's been sold out for a while. And then I would guess it gets picked up. And then if it, it's done well, which I'm sure it will. It uh, then will travel to other film festivals, but to premiere at Tribeca, I mean, is there a better one <laughs> to premiere no. at? And so, and so from there, then it, uh, but I think you're right, then it probably goes on to uh, to Amazon Prime or something. By the way, I watched one this weekend. I don't Have you watched Hurley about the race car driver, the LGBT, or the gay race car driver from the 70s? No. It was a documentary Ooh. you saw. Ooh. Bad. Well, I probably shouldn't have clouded it, but maybe you should watch it. I shouldn't, probably shouldn't have clouded it. You're a documentary fan. You're allowed to have an opinion about stuff like this. Yeah, Brian, Brian, and and Jamie and Rich and I watched it over the weekend, and um, Brian was a little cloudy over it, but I think that might have been the Chardonnay talking. But Jamie and I um, felt this story could have been told in three minutes, and uh, but it dragged on and on and on. But essentially, it was he was a closeted race car driver. And was very popular and did well, but um, had a had a boyfriend or a husband partner, and um, who cared less about racing, and the matchup just did not seem, the coupling did not seem like it made sense. Anyway, the whole thing was so disjointed. The editing was horrible, but I had seen it before, and and, and uh, on you know you go and you click through the documentaries on Netflix, and so I thought, well, this seems interesting. Now I know why I've never heard of him. Um, it was not interesting in the least. But um, give it a listen. Did, did you feel you like tossed your time away? Well, all you have to do is watch the trailer and okay. pick it up. But but essentially, it was he was he was closeted, but it never really um, 
it never dove into the fact of what life was like for him to be as a, a race car driver yeah. and closeted other than he never told anybody. And I wanted, I wanted to learn more about what he experienced as being the driver because there was lots of times people were trying to hook him up with women or something, but, and people would say, Oh, looking back on it now, maybe, but there was never any hmm. development of the character or, or that story of that storyline. Right. Yeah. I wanted to know more about his life outside of driving the race car. I could care less that he won races. I want to know what his life was like. Hmm. We didn't do documentaries this weekend. We went down memory lane. We rewatched uh, Judy Garland and A Star is Born on Turner Classic Movies and also Dr. Zhivago, um, uh, which is about the whole, the, the Russian, the October surprise, the Russian Revolution and the love story. And we marvel at the fact that I'm not sure they could make A Star is Born today. Um, there's a lot of interesting behaviors in there that, that the characters have that we would look at today and say, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> And Chivago, Chivago, um, I thought that still held up pretty well, but all right, so Hurley is what I got to check out, right? Yeah. Well, just, you know, flip through. Yeah. I also watched the Westminster Kennel Club, the dog show. Did it, you was watch out, that? it was outside. It was outdoors this year, right? No, I think it was inside. I mean, it was inside a, now whether it was inside a tent or whatever. Here's what I never understand about these dog shows. So there's the best in show, right? So they have all the different breeds. How can you pick the best one from a Whippet to a Pekingese? <laughs> Or a, a sheepdog. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Right? Like picking your favorite yeah. kid. And they had this old woman there in, in her purple, you know, clip clopping around in her open toed slingbacks. And she ends up picking this. We'd have never picked it. It looked like a mop. It was a Pekingese, which won. That's best the one that won. Yeah, I remember seeing that on the news. Yeah. But there were so many. I don't know. I would have picked the Whippet, I think. But <laughs> I think the Whippet came in second. <laughs> I but um, I don't know how you pick out of all the dogs. And they're all I beautiful. They're all excellent. Yeah. yeah. I think it's subjective. They're all excellent representations of all the breeds, and they're really well behaved. I mean, it's fun to watch because, yeah, it's just fun to watch. I want to do. I wanted to do a mutt dog show. I thought a mutt dog show would be funny, and I think somebody actually did take my idea and actually did it. Wouldn't a mutt dog show be funny? <laughs> you could have you could have shares. Share could be doing the theme song "Half Breed." That's all I ever heard. <laughs> she can't sing that song anymore, can she? <sighs> See, there she is... can't sing. She can't sing gypsies, tramps, and thieves. thieves. She can't do any of it. Especially in Barcelona, you don't want to use the word gypsy in Barcelona. <laughs> we learned that still, Someone, still to this day. Fear. That German grabbed you by the neck, <laughs> Mister <laughs> Nash. Do you know that do, in? Do not yell that word here. In in this country, gypsy <laughs> is equal to the N word in your country. I was like, <gasps> I was appalled. You're screaming, watch out for the gypsies! <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody told us not to bring backpacks to Spain or wallets the gypsies, or keys. The gypsies were going to cut the like. They're looking at you and I. You, you brought these backpacks, and they said that gypsies will use box cutters and cut the straps and run away with your backpacks. Remember? Yeah, that's what we were told. <laughs> so we were. So, so you're telling everybody not to for like three or four days before anybody told us not to use the word gypsy in Spain. <laughs> and we're kind of like we use it in the U.S., right? All the time. Cherish things about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note. What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. You're up first, Mr. Bennett, and it better not be a gypsy story. Well, it's pretty far-fetched, so it's close enough. I don't know if you saw this. This happened in one of our favorite places. Well, in Provincetown, if you want a vacation there, stay at the pool if you, unless you want to walk through the rice paddy. <laughs> with the tides up to your neck with a cooler over your head. Looking like you're walking through Vietnam. Anyway, I, I will never understand the beach. But um, so this is a, a headline from from the uh, the newspaper up in uh, in in P Town, uh, the uh, Cape Cod Times. The headline is: I was completely inside. Lobster diver swallowed by humpback whale whale off coast of Provincetown. Now some people are wondering whether this really happened. He says it did. <laughs> now, so see, thank was, you for reading my mind. The minute you said the headline, I'm like, this is not a Moby Dick story, is it? So I, I've got I've got to read it to make sure we get it right. So this was a little before 8 a.m. last Friday. A veteran lobster diver, Michael Packard, entered the water for a second dive of the day. So a lobster diver, what they do is they go into the water, they go to the bottom, and they grab the migrating lobsters from the bottom of the, the ocean and the sand that are migrating. It's usually the water's quite cold. They grab the lobsters, they bring them in, they take them to the lobster pot, and we eat them. 
right? Mm -hmm. Essentially what happened. Specifically at the lobster pot, yeah. (laughs) Right, which we love the chowder. So his vessel, we do like we do like Pete Town. Just don't go to the beach. The um, his <laughs> vessel, the J and J, was right off Herring Cove Beach, surrounded by a fleet of other boats. They were catching striped bass and a bunch of other things. He said the water was a balmy sixty degrees. Visibility under underneath the water was only about twenty feet. There were a bunch of other lobster divers there, pick, pluck, plucking the lobsters off the sandy bottom. And uh, he dove down, and he said the ocean food chain was in full evidence. He was 35 feet down, and uh, he said he was literally swallowed by a humpback whale. All of a sudden, he felt a huge shove. The next thing he knew, it was completely black. He said, I could sense I was moving, and I was inside the whale. He said, I could feel the whale squeezing in his muscles, in his mouth. I thought it was a great white shark, but I couldn't feel any teeth. <laughs> I don't know how he went to great white shark, but okay. So he said he felt a shove. He was inside the whale, and uh, he was he thought he was he was in the whale. He said, I, I was completely inside the whale. It was completely black. I thought to myself, there's no way I'm getting out of here. I'm done. I'm dead. All I could think about was my boys. They're 12 and 15 years old. He started struggling. The whale began shaking its head. So then uh, Packard said um, he didn't know what to do. He estimated he was inside the whale for 30 or 40 seconds. And then the whale was getting upset. <laughs> so the whale finally surfaced. They said that his, his partner, Joshua Mayo, was in the boat. He said he saw an explosion of water as the whale surfaced. The whale started shaking its head, thrashing around. The whale burped him out. And he went into the water. They plucked him up. They called the P-Town Emergency Services and headed back to shore. So they said, uh, considering all things considered, after the whale ejected him out or burped him out, I guess, they thought he may have broken a leg, but he had all he had was a little bit of soft tissue damage. They said overall he was pretty good. Sister, they called the sister. She said, you know, she heard about it as well. It was the talk of the town. They thought it was a far-flung story. The Provincetown Fire Department was there. The ambulance took him to the Cape Cod Hospital. They said, thank God it wasn't a shark. And uh, so then they had talked to an to a expert. So the expert, uh, Joe <laughs> the way Robbins, you The way you just moved your head, it, that's kind of like an air quote, like expert. <laughs> right. She says, so she says, based upon what was described, this certainly was a mistake on part of the humpback. She said, and she's director of humpback whale studies at the Center for Coastal Studies in P-Town. Imagine that job. <laughs> Humpbacks are not aggressive animals, particularly toward humans, she said. She said, based on the description, this whale may have been on the small side. She suspects it was a juvenile that was feeding on the sand. She said, when humpbacks open their mouths to feed, they tend to block their forward vision, and they just open their mouth. And uh, their jaw, so she said she just, the whale probably just went forward and got him stuck in there. And instead of swallowing, closed its mouth canal and then just got up and threw him out. <laughs> she said it's nothing she's ever heard before, but it's possible. She said so many things end up happening in the path of a feeding whale. She said, although it's, you know, not, not necessarily common, maybe it's possible. Another, Charles Stormy Mayo, another scientist, she, he said uh, he's also at the Center for Coastal Studies in P-Town, says he agrees that it's exceedingly rare. And uh, so they, they said that uh, they're not aware of other incidents where somebody had been swallowed by a well. They don't think he was necessarily swallowed. He was just in the mouth. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, you, so you... now there's lots of questions about whether this really happened. He's been on all over the TV, of course. He's lying in this hospital bed. There's a picture of him lying in a bed with all kinds of things on him. He says he was he was in there, and, and people are questioning whether this really happened. Um, other divers say, yes, he was there, and the whale popped out, and he popped out. And But they but there is a record of them calling the rescue squad, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. there is something there, like, so something probably happened, and they did, in fact— call and say here's, hey, here's what happened. i think happened he was down there getting lobster the whale came by and bumped into him pushed him along a little bit he didn't know what happened the whale f- came up with him somehow you know, yeah with him pushed him out friends saw it oh my god it was eaten by the whale mm. you know whale, whale, you know burnt me up 
Oh my God, take me to the hospital. You just took that poor oceanographer's salary. You just figured it out, right? <laughs> oh, come on. Do you think the whale swap put him in his stomach? I don't know about that, yeah. Mine, uh, mine could not be more different, but... Uh, happy pride happy pride top of the pride to you swallowed by a whale and pee down Arr, shiver me timbers <laughs> all right you will really love this one this is and i got mauled by a bear, bear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah grizzly all right you're gonna love this one uh headline reads cops chased a disabled woman for not wearing a helmet on a mobility scooter after a night of karaoke with friends in Brookings, Oregon, in November of 2018, Jennifer it's Gaiman, Oregon story. Uh, like not, a third Oregon, story Oregon all over the place, 50, started to make her way home on her mobility scooter, a device she's reliant on for transportation due to her multiple disabilities. But two Brookings police officers stopped Gaiman on her way there. The cops accused her of using her scooter on a sidewalk failing to walk it across a crosswalk and not wearing a helmet. Low-level offenses that triggered a dispute in which Gaiman repeatedly brought up her rights as a disabled person. The cops then proceeded to cite her on multiple offenses, including unsafe operation of a motor-assisted scooter before telling her that she couldn't ride her mobility device back to her residence without the proper protective headgear, according to a federal lawsuit that she filed in 2020. So, faced with the choice of exercising her right to drive home on the scooter, and face unlawful retaliation by the officers or attempt to walk home in freezing temperatures, Gaiman opted to gun it on the schooner, and she headed home. What followed uh, was a low-speed chase. <laughs> that was is that apparently really, is that, that really her? That was apparent. Yes, that's a body cam image of her. That was apparently enough to spur a low-speed police chase that ended in Gaiman's garage. It was 15 miles an hour, by the way. Cops, yeah, cops restrained Gaiman and charged her with fleeing police. She was later convicted and sentences to, sentenced to five days in jail, according to the Oregonian. More than two and a half years later, this has been dismissed. Um, you know, there she wasn't fleeing or attempting to elude the police. She was very upset. She tried to explain to them all her disabilities, but they didn't, you know, didn't believe this. And in a brazen and clumsy display of authority, officers pursued plaintiff on her mobility scooter at approximately 15 miles per hour for the next several minutes called for backup, and turned on full lights and sirens. Woo! She's going along. <laughs> and her, her lawyer concluded, this pathetic and low-speed chase ended at plaintiff's home where several officers took hold of and arrested plaintiff. Could you believe this? H how does this happen, right? I mean, she's... Well, you know what happened here. I bet she's one of these complainers all the time about something in town, and this was just a comeuppance. Do you, think, you, so? think? Do you think so? Yeah. Remember, we, we, you and I had an incident like this in town back in the day in high school. And I remember the mayor called the militant handicaps. Yeah, and they, yeah, yeah, I do remember it quite well. And in fact, I'm not accusing. I'm just observing <laughs> that I'm sure there was something more to this, to this story of here she comes again. Here I, she, we're going to get her this time. I would like to see the TV drama where she's going at 15 on the battery operated thing <laughs> and the car behind her with full lights and siren. Pull over, pull over, you know. I only in Oregon. Pull over, pull over, Janice. Janice, pull over, Janice. I'm not pulling over. I, I, I'm only in Oregon. I suppose is is how we say it. I, I don't know, but that was uh, what caught my eye. So, moving right along, folks. Uh, as many of you know, Deep Discount is a partner of ours here on the Focus Group, and we would like you to go to our site, focusgroupradio.com, and click on the Deep Discount logo and start your shopping extravaganza. It is a site-wide sale, one of our favorite times of the year because we get to free range and buy what we like. So Mr. Bennett, what did you select from all of the variety at Deep Discount? I found something you can't find anywhere. It's the best of Johnny <laughs> Cash, the best of Johnny Cash TV show from 1969 to 1971. It's only $12 in DVD. So it's all the best musical acts. It's uh, close to an hour and a half long. But it features some great artists, not only Johnny Cash, but uh, people like Bob Dylan, uh, Charlie Pride, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Glenn Campbell, Louis Armstrong, Linda Ronstadt, James Taylor, Roy Clark, Stevie Wonder, Neil Young, Loretta, Long, jo uh, Loretta Lynn, Joni Mitchell, Roy Orbison, Tammy Wynette, and others, many, many, many others, uh, Ray Charles, uh, Pete Seeger, dot, dot, dot. So it's, uh, you can pick that up at deep discount. 
All righty. I would not have picked you as a Johnny Cash TV show fan, but I, I like it. I like your style, and I like. I like the, the music. You know, this is all the best musical acts, and you can't find these anywhere. I mean, this is uh, uh, this is not something you're going to be able to stream somewhere. You, so you are get so right about that because he did have great guests. My pick is uh, one I've picked in the past, but this is a sci-fi movie that I really like a lot. It's called Gattaca, and the reason I selected this is because it literally just came out as a re-release, a 4K master with a Blu-ray and digital copy included. Uh, literally came out yesterday, the 15th, um, and we're doing wow. our show here on the 16th. So um, it's a very, very slick, well-done uh, science fiction movie, and it's basically this. In an all-too-possible future, Genetic engineering has divided the world into lab-created perfect humans and naturally born invalids, or invalids, what they say, invalid, who are doomed to menial tasks and, and live an early death on, on Earth. Uh, Ethan Hawke is a young invalid who resorts to deceit in order to fulfill his dream of taking part in a manned space mission. But great cast, Jude Law, um, Ethan Hawke, and I think that's Uma Thurman. So um, Gattaca arrives, re-released, beautifully done on Blu-ray and 4K. Um and that's at twenty one ninety nine. And the, what the release this week is something I thought you might enjoy, Tim. Do you like the Godzilla movies? I, uh, are you are you mixed? <laughs> you know, I'm mixed. The mixed is a good is a good way of saying it. You know, this is a new this is a new release. So this is Godzilla versus Kong. In an ancient subterranean world deep inside the Earth lies a power source sought by a cybernetics company to combat Godzilla, and only King Kong can acquire it. The two mammoth monsters are going head to head wrecking havoc on an unsuspecting hong kong i guess it's always hong kong that takes the beating right or, or, well now <laughs> it is now it is that the chinese own it yeah. so they're always getting beat up and blown up but they may need to combine their colossal strength uh when metal menace mega godzilla mecha godzilla rages out of control so mecha means it's probably like a robot of some sort Fourth entry in the combined monsterverse series stars alexander skarsgård millie bobby brown rebecca hall so it's got a good cast. All right, so wow, yeah. that's a new release, huh? Indeed. So be sh so be sure to uh, head over to focusgroupradio.com and start clicking away. It's a site-wide sale from our friends at Deep Discount. We like that you support them because they support us. I picked Johnny Cash, the uh, the best of his TV show and all his musical acts. John picked a uh, movie that's just come out, been redone, called Gattaca. Gattaca. That, yeah. Gattaca is that how I say it? And the new release is Godzilla vs Kong. So, uh, again, head over to Deep Discount and uh, start shopping away. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got our business birthday and some shop talk for you. So stay tuned. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Now, back to the focus group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. Hey, welcome back to the focus group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. Focusgroupradio.com is the URL for our website. And if you want to reach us, it's letters at focusgroupradio.com, and be sure to check out TFG Unbuttoned, our Tuesday audio podcast. This is also an audio podcast, but it has a video component as well, so we have a little YouTube stuff going on. So um, here we are in the second half. Uh, by the way, both caught our eyes. I th <laughs> it, it kind of shows you where our heads are at when we're reading headlines. You went for the whale story, right? And I went for I thought the, for sure you might have seen that. I had not, and I went for the... Uh, the poor disabled woman in Oregon getting chased down at 15 miles an hour by a cop car with full lights and siren on because she wasn't wearing a helmet, even though she's disabled and she's in a mobility scooter. It's just you and I love to see things like this, right? You know, this people behaving in odd ways, right? Going 15 miles an hour, yeah. chase her down, get her, get her. I mean, how, <laughs> it's just get her. Just, I'm going to take care of her. It's just crazy. Just nothing but a pain in the ass. All right, so as we kick off our second half, uh, later on we're going to have a, a two shop talks that look at the rainbow and pride, and specifically the first one's about how many companies are diving in with rainbow logos and rainbow merchandise and how uh, some people find it to be disingenuous. And then there's 
A second article about how corporate America is perceived to be very helpful, but they maybe can do more when it comes to their LGBTQ employees. But before that, we have... Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So this is actually a real business that's having a birthday today. It's uh, the uh, the candy we all love, Cracker Jack, was, uh, was invented today in 1893, 128 years old. So when I was poking around looking for a, a person's birthday today, there was only um, two other people. One of them was the founder of an ad agency, and the other two were, quite frankly, not interesting. And so I decided... <laughs> Um, okay, <laughs> they're out. <laughs> so, uh, so I came upon Cracker Jack, and I didn't know a lot about. I guess I should know more about Cracker Jack than I did. But do you know much about Cracker Jack? I do not know, except that it was one of our favorite candies as a kid, and it always had a toy inside. That there was always something inside, a little prize, right? Right. So, um, so Cracker Jack is an American brand of snack food that consists of molasses flavored caramel or caramel, caramel, coated, caramel. <laughs> Coated popcorn and peanuts, well known for being packaged with a prize or of trivial value inside. Its uh, its slogan was "The more you eat, the more you want." It, the slogan was registered way back in 1896, and uh, food historians consider it America's very first junk food. America's and, very first junk food, really? Okay. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, it um, it also has a famous connection to baseball. And uh, it it um, and then we'll get into a little bit bit more about who owned it and so forth. But the origin of this sugar coated popcorn they they said it's somewhat unknown. There's been lots written back as early as 1857 and a number of different papers and stuff with people that had um, people that had done recipes. And the actual guy though that people really feel um, that invented this is a guy named Frederick William Rueckheim. And so he invented this at the at the World's Fair in Chicago, and introduced this. And uh, so so he had um, developed this popcorn 1873 with a partner of his and formed the company at the World's uh, Columbian. They called it the Columbian Exposition or the Chicago World's Fair. And uh, they initially had some molasses as, as an earlier version of it, but. Um, they had kept working, and in 1896, they discovered another method that would help it make it easier to separate the kernels. And uh, they used like a cement mixer kind of drum and, and put in a little small quanti- quantity of oil, and then he'd spin it around. That would guarantee that it wouldn't stick. And then they also had put it in this waxed, sealed package. So remember the box? I do, yeah. So, so the box, they had to, because if, if they didn't package it, it um, would get stale, first started right? Packaging, yeah, it would all be just one big hard brick. So they developed this box, and um, for freshness, it was known. It was called the Extine Triple Proof Package, a dust, germ, and moisture proof paper package. Um, in 1907, there was a song, "Take Me Out to the Ball Game," and uh, it gave Cracker Jack free publicity. You know, buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. Oh. So that's how it got associated with baseball. And so many baseball teams and baseball stadiums and, and uh, baseball fields would end up selling Cracker Jack at, uh, at baseball games because of the song. The, uh, the name, the uh, origin of the name, I didn't know that a Cracker Jack um, was a colloquial term for something that was good or excellent or awesome. Hey, that's Cracker Jack. I didn't know that either. I didn't know that yeah, either. Yeah, so... So they said that what happened was they were doing a sampling of this at the World's Fair, and somebody said to him after he handed some out, they said, hey, that's Cracker Jack. Like that, and so that's how the name came about. And uh, he ended up using the mascot of a sailor and uh, his dog, Bingo. The, the, the dog was a, um, was a stray dog that was a friend of theirs. <laughs> and um, the sailor icon was, uh, was a, grandson of, a grandson of a friend of theirs who died of pneumonia at eight. So he was the image of the sailor, and uh, the dog was a, a friend of theirs' dog who was a, uh, a stray of, uh, of the dog of the guy who invented the, uh, the, paper, the paper box. The uh, company was purchased uh, in 1964 by Frito-Lay, and then it was sold to PepsiCo, um, or parent to PepsiCo in 97. They announced that they were taking the toy out. 
and there was a cue. Um, I was going to you know, cue, cue the code. outrage and the pushback, right? Was there like a, a, an effort to make sure the toy went back in? Yeah, everybody was upset about it. Um, but they've actually a lot of people are upset with what uh, Frito Lay has done to the brand. And uh, there's been actually a lot of outrage. They've, they, they've actually done a lot of brand extension. They have something called Cracker Jacked, which is lots of caffeine. And they changed the packaging from red, white, and blue to black. I've not seen it recently. Neither have I. Neither have I. In fact, the picture <laughs> the, you provided for the graphic we are showing on the video on YouTube is what I consider to be like the classic looking package. A little different than when we were kids, but that's pretty much what it was. Right. They said in, in 2004, the New York Yankees baseball team replaced Cracker Jack with uh, Crunch a Munch at home games, and the public went crazy. <laughs> and they ended up, the New Yorkers went crazy, ended up switching back to Cracker Jack. Um, they advertised on TV as early as 1955. They, um, and they talk about a number of different people. They actually did a Super Bowl commercial in 1991, or I'm sorry, 1999. So the toys, um, interestingly, they said Cracker Jack originally included a small mystery novelty item referred to as a toy surprise in each box. And um, it, they said the first um, prize was in 1914 when they produced two Cracker Jack baseball cards and they would feature major league baseball players. But other toy surprises included rings, plastic figurines, booklets, stickers, temporary tattoos, decoder rings. And um, there's actually a substantial collector's market for some of these things. Up until 1937, most stuff was made in Japan. And they were also designed by the same people who did the Monopoly, um, <laughs> Monopoly toy pieces. The, the, the board, the game pieces, the board pieces, yeah. Right. And they said that, um, that uh, under Frito-Lay, the toy and trinket prizes were replaced with paper prizes, displaying riddles and jokes, then temporary tattoos. In 2013, um, prizes became codes for people to play nostalgic games on the Cracker Jack app through Google Play. The announcement was made in 2016 that the games would then replace tangible prizes. And people were not happy. Um, the, uh, they said also that, the, uh, that this, obviously, the World's Fair not only gave us Cracker Jack, it also gave us the Ferris wheel, Aunt Jemima pancakes, and ice cream cones were also introduced at the same event. Um, there are a couple of other, um, items. Cracker Jack is, was the world's largest user of toys more than 17 billion they said, since, since 1912. So toys have gone through so that 70 billion packages. Some of the prizes are valued as much as 7,000. If you have some of the original things that were in the boxes, the most valuable prizes, there were two sets of baseball cards, which are worth $125,000. Oh, my God. So, some of the original baseball cards in the box. So, no, happy birthday to uh, Cracker Jacks. So, Tim, 128 did you 28 years old today. Did you ever read the, the Devil in the White City? I started it, and I threw the book away. Now, you know that was about the when World's Fair where this this came yeah. from. This was Cracker Jacks and the, the Ferris wheel, and uh, it was. I thought it was a great book. You didn't enjoy it? I didn't. I'm being flip. I, I <laughs> oh, you so, read it and you. Everyone donate. knows. Everyone knows I'm moving, so I had the book, and I was going to read it. And as I was moving, I was trying to recycle everything, and I thought I'm going to download it so I can because the print was too small for me, unless I had a magnifying glass. So that's why I got thrown away. It didn't get thrown <laughs> away because I didn't want to read the book. Got it. But I okay. did. I did. It, it was on, it was on my list. But I I've heard it's a wonderful book. Did it you is. like it? I I we yes adored it. Um, and that also launched the author on doing several other books. Uh, that right. that Bob's actually kept up on. But for me, it was The Devil in the White City was my favorite. For uh, I was it Eric Larson, I think was the writer. Uh, was it? but it, I, I, he never mentioned Cracker Jacks in that one. But but that World's Fair, a lot came out of it, and I just think it's a fascinating evolution of a candy and a toy, and and people's just love of some of this stuff, right? Like, don't mess with our Cracker Jacks. Don't take the toy out. I wonder if there's a, a Cracker Jack toy museum anywhere, you know, where they have rows of the stuff that got out. I mean, most of it's disposable, but there might be some unique stuff, right? Well, I was trying to think. Did you ever? I mean, I used to. They they did say they they um the one complaint people had is they they ended up Frito did put more peanuts in people said there weren't enough peanuts, peanuts so yeah. they did they did add more peanuts but I remember getting the toy and if I didn't get a toy toy I didn't want to get a tattoo no if it was a temporary tattoo or a little miniature coloring book it just gone but if it was something like a little soldier or a little car right. or something yeah I kept that 
There you go. All right. So um, as we mentioned at the start of the broadcast, we have some pride related. Happy pride. The leprechaun says we got some pride related stories. And the first one coming our way is about the the rainbowing of an, anything under the sun during June, uh, which seems to be the big thing here. So uh, the headline reads, whether it's rainbow capitalism or bad design, LGBTQ people are calling it disingenuous, they're calling out, sorry, disingenuous pride merchandise. Every year on the first breath of summer, <laughs> I love this, pride collections emerge like a horde of brightly colored locusts. They blanket every storefront and Instagram feed in June, promising solidarity and, solidarity and celebration for LGBTQ communities. T-shirts that say, yes, queen, and shirts proclaim love is love, the decorative buttons affirm. Then there are the rainbow printed suits and shoes, which bear no actual words, but are still so very, very loud. Make no mistake, visibility and acceptance are rights for which generations of activists have fought, but a growing chorus of LGBTQ voices are ridiculing the way Pride Month is being marketed by large companies, especially as they grow bolder with their use of queer language and imagery. Maybe it's rainbow capitalism, the idea that some companies use LGBTQ allyship for their own gain. Maybe it's simply bad design, but something doesn't sit right. So this whole article talks about how brands basically come out with pride merchandise the gap does it i mean i think most major brands do Coles the whole bit and this goes to the core of some people thinking hmm you know just because it's a rainbow colored fanny pack from a big company does that mean that i'm they're supporting of us do we support them is that your just uh, is that your take here mr bennett well that, well that's why on our facebook page which is focus group radio i put on that rainbow dumpster yeah, because and then you got pushback we, we, for that. but Well, we've gone crazy with Rainbow. But I also feel this is where companies throw their hands up. Because you and I have heard this in research w- over years and years and years. And companies are told we want to be visible. We want to be treated like everybody else. Yep. We want to be included. Um, we don't want to be separated, right? So when companies are now adopting the rainbow and they're now marketing it just like they market mother's day Mm -hmm. just like they market halloween just like they market christmas now the the gay community is not happy because there's too much rainbow in june well we all complain there's too much you know christmas stuff around christmas time where there's too much pumpkin spice around halloween (laughs) right so if you want to be integrated they're just now taking and marketing june just like they market Mother's Day or Halloween or anything else, right? So, but now they're not happy because they want um, these companies to weigh more in on social justice and politics. And I'm not so sure that's where the companies are going to go. And so you and I have seen this many times with uh, companies we worked with that it's one thing to be supportive and there's one thing to have your HR policies in, in, in play. And the one thing you and I would get dinged on when you and I were asked to go talk places is, Lots of companies would have uh, inclusive HR policies internally, and you and I would always say, well, what are you doing to let the consumer know that you're supportive? And whether there was advertising or there was some sort of other um, method to let the consumer know that you were welcoming, and you and I would get disinvited because they didn't want to talk about it, right? They didn't want to, be, they didn't want to show that they were doing something beyond what their internal policies were, which you and I would then call BS on. Yeah, so, and, and to that example... We were, yeah, Tim is correct. We've often been invited to speak um, inter- to internal, like employee resource groups, like the LGBT group at a company like Acme Products or something. I, I'm making that up. And then they would ask us what we're going to speak about. And our expertise is actually on the consumer facing side. You know, we, we will help a company craft messaging and advertising to speak to their LGBTQ consumers authentically. And with good creative, the whole bit. So then it would be like, well, we don't really do that. And then then we would answer and say, well, that could be a subject of conversation with your employee resource group is internally, do you want to try to drive marketing to reach out to this consumer or these individuals? And then the whole thing just short circuited because well, they don't want to do it. And then to be honest with you, Tim, I'm not sure I could have had a, a meaningful presentation about the internal HR policies of a company, right? I mean, with our whole expertise was outward facing. It was consumer facing. It wasn't like a B two B thing. Um, so, to Tim's point, though, the uh, the 
president of GLAD, Sarah Kate Ellis, says that companies should do more meaningful structural work before they come to the table waving a rainbow flag. Now, this is, of course, GLAD's opinion. You cannot just market to our community, Ellis said. You have to join the movement, and that's a social justice movement. You need to speak out when there is a bad legislation, especially when you have outsized influence. Um, and then she said a lot of the work begins in-house, as Tim was mentioning, with inclusive HR policies, diverse intersectional representation among directors and leaders, and such efforts should be sustained all year, not just in June. So, you know, I see where you, I, I get what you're saying with this merchandise thing and putting a rainbow on anything. It's darned if you do and darned if you don't, right? <laughs> this coming from Glad, which are the celebrity of all whores, right? I mean, Glad was all about celebrity, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, well, they, you know. Uh, Glad was all about positive representation in the media, and obviously that ref- they, they got that message across by aligning with uh, popular stars and celebrities who could move that message forward. But yeah, I I don't know. Like the picture we're showing on the YouTube uh, video has a I don't know what store that is. It could be a Kohl's or a Target, but there's a a mannequin wearing a rainbow suit and tie now. I don't know what world I would ever buy that in, and I'm not even sure what world I would try it on. (laughs) But uh, there you go. And in the background, there's a Mickey Mouse T-shirt, and he's wearing a rainbow T-shirt, the Mickey Mickey guy in the background. So, you know, I just... I think that there was probably a, it was probably well-intentioned. A, a lot of these efforts are probably well-intentioned. Hey, let's show our support for the community by creating um, a unique T-shirt or an outfit or something. And then, but you see, that's where it goes afoul because the minute you do that and you put it out there, now it's going to be judged and interpreted, right? And if you interpret it, you're like, what are you? What else are you doing for us? Why aren't you yelling at the at the top of your lung at the state capitol or something? So it's it's a hard one, I think. I don't think it's hard. You know, I think it's I I don't because I think it's I I think it's you. It, it goes back to what what I what I said earlier is that if you want to be treated like everybody else, this is what co- companies do. They want to sell product, right? So if you want to be treated, if you want June to be LGBTQ Pride Month, and you want to be recognized, how is it any different than what they do for Halloween or Valentine's Day? What do they do? They start putting put valentine's candy out the day after christmas well i think people might argue that um a holiday like you know uh, saint patrick's day happy pride or (laughs) or something like that is slightly different than the parades and the recognition of all the work that's gone for um advancing the community and social justice so it's a disconnect you've basically described the disconnect Uh, on the one hand you have people who are like this is fantastic. Anything counts or how dare you do this? You haven't earned the, the credibility. And you're saying, be careful what you wish for. It may come true. Companies now recognize this as a holiday for LGBTQ consumers and they want to put something out there for us, right? First of all, pride should be the same time every, every year. It well, be the last Sunday of the of you, last you Sunday yeah, in June. We've written articles right? about that. Yeah, right. Last Sunday in June. That's pride. It That's shouldn't right. be in October. Shouldn't it be in September. It Weather dependent. First Saturday <laughs> at the, after the second Wednesday in June. Yeah, no. I mean, all these cities, right? Every every it is the whole month. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So all right, and the I'm uh, a curmudgeon. No, no, you've you've had you have very strong opinions about this because we've sat in these meetings and we've we've tried to help people figure this out. So it's it's not the easiest thing in the world. What are you uh, gonna do? Yeah. What What are we gonna do? Okay. Last story. A rainbow logo isn't enough. This is a very natural segue into this one. Why LGBTQ workers say some pride celebrations fall short? In a nutshell, uh, this is the community saying to the corporations uh, that they work for who might sponsor a pride parade or do exactly what we were just talking about for that previous story about um, branding merchandise or putting rainbows on things. You need to be more engaged uh, because there still is discrimination. There still is harassment. Multiple legislatures across the country are looking and taking up anti-trans legislation from athletic stuff to the what we have fond memories of the stupid bathroom bills. Um, I think this touches the same nerve for you, though, right, Tim? Or am I wrong? Is this a little different? No, no, this is all, this is all within the same thing. And we've done, you know, I'm actually really pleased with the amount of stories that have come out this June. Um, the proliferation of, of 
the rainbows and there's actually have been a lot of stories this year. It Good seems stories. As, yeah. Yeah. And you know, this is, a, this is about how employees still feel that they're discriminated against. Um, if they, if they come out at work, um, or how they still may have been overlooked for uh, a promotion. And and so th- this one particular, I guess it's Glassdoor and, and uh, LinkedIn have both looked and, and done some surveys. And, you know, we need to pass the Equality Act, right? I mean, that's the bottom line is, is, is we need to pass the Equality Act in this country so that everybody's treated fairly. Because you could still get fired for being in a number of states, you could still, still be fired for being LGBTQ in this country. Mm-hmm. And um, and so that's an issue. And so if your company is putting, you know, that you're changing their logo to be a rainbow, but um, doesn't have all their policies in order, then, you know, how do you, is, is it disingenuous? Yeah, this uh, this article said that um, beyond harassment and discrimination, many LGBTQ workers also report being unsatisfied with how they feel their organization supports or rather does not support the LGBTQ community. And this has been a tension that's existed for, well, many, many years now, actually. Um, Internal, we hear all the stories from people who have gone through bias training. Sometimes it's really well done. Sometimes companies barely give it a thought. So it's still an evolving situation, and I agree. Um, It all comes down to the internal policies and what that company feels. But I I don't always expect a company that has great internals to then go to the state house and, you know, a complaint about a legislation, a, leg- a legislative act or something. I think it's six of one, half dozen another. Well, that's, and that's always the the danger. I mean, I, I don't, I, I'm not critical of companies that donate to both political campaigns. Yeah, because they do, you, you, you and I know the calculus. Someone's going to win. I want to be, I want to make sure I didn't step on any toes, you know. Right, and they're going to, they, they need legislation for a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. And they're going to need, they're going to need uh, bipartisan support probably somewhere along the way. So that happens, so. But uh, I am pleased with a lot of the stories. So these were these were two good shop talks you you picked this this month. So, hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, this uh, John, down to do your happy pride. Happy pride and the top happy of the pride, pride to you. And uh, well, let's all let's all hope you get an Oscar for your your film uh, debut. Coded and, uh, and coded at coded. the Tribeca Film Festival. Sure. And thanks to our friends at Deep Discount. Be sure to go to focusgroupradio.com and click on the Deep Discount logo. Start shopping away. And uh, I picked uh, the Johnny Cash movie this week. John picked Gattaca. And the new release is Godzilla vs. Kong. We hope you all have a good week. And we'll see you on Tuesday with TFG Unbuttoned. Take care. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.